Um, I could probably go on like this for another hour or so. We're going to run out of time. So I want to move on to another topic, if that's OK. Um, in addition to understanding that there are these, you know, in applied behavior analysis, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between LOBA style, traditional ABA, and what we're doing in a verbal behavior approach to ABA. But I found that a lot of you don't even really understand what ABA is to begin with. So I had to do that whole process first to kind of explain that. Um, I think the differences between the two are probably less important to you um, at this point. What's more important is, is the basic understanding of what it is we can now do for children with autism that we really couldn't do 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and that there may be children in your lives that you're teaching that are making you know, incremental success that appears to be good work. But when you see what kind of success could potentially be done with some of these kids, um, you start to think to yourself, you know, maybe I should need to raise my expectations. Maybe I need to look at how I'm teaching and I need to be, have a more systematic approach. Um, ultimately, that's what happened to me as a teacher, is I started saying, what is it that's going to really work the best for me? And I found my way to ABA, and I found my way to verbal behavior. Um, but um, one of the things that we have to do whenever we teach is we have to earn something that I call instructional control. I call it. I don't call it instructional control. It is called instructional control. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> um, there is, uh, in, in LOVAS style programming, they used to call it compliance training, where we have to get the child willing to participate, willing to make choices to be a part of it. And the way that traditionally that was done was we put the child into a specific area that we knew this is going to be our teaching zone. And it's usually a table with a chair, and the teacher sits across and, and puts the child in that chair and holds them there, and then starts to teach and shows the child that if you stay here and if you engage with me, I have a reinforcement for you. So you put some time and saying, well, what are reinforcers for the child? Well, maybe like, like you guys, this whole group here would love the bar idea. I can tell that right away. So for you guys, having you know a, a bar behind me, and every time you guys did something that I was looking for, I can give you a shot. If that worked for you as a reinforcer, great. I can teach you with that as a reinforcer. What you use as a reinforcer is only determined by what actually works for that individual. So if the child is interested in absolutely nothing to play with, no social interactions, nothing else, and all they care about is I want chocolate, I want chips, I want fried fries, well, in the beginning, that may be all you have to work with. But most kids, you can find other things that they're interested in. Tickles, for a lot of kids. Um, rough play. Um, um, putting them on your back and, and running them around like this. All kinds of things. Jumping on a trampoline. So even the most basic kids tend to like more than just food. And it's important that we identify what all of these type of things are so that we have those that we can use them. Now in a traditional LOA style program, they would take all those things and they'd bring them to the table. And then they would teach the child that as long as you stay here in the seat, I'll keep giving you these things as long as you're making good choices. And the child starts to work for these items. The problem is, is that once the child says, you know what, I don't want that item anymore, or I actually don't care about that item, I want something else, and they try to get up, well then you would use something called escape extinction. You would not let the child get up. You would make him participate, and then you would continue to reinforce. And when you do this, it works successfully for a lot of kids. They start to say, oh, well, you know what, actually it's worth it to stay seated, I can't get up anyway, and when I do sit here, things go well, I get a lot of stuff I like. Uh, but for some kids, that just causes them to want those things you have even less and it causes them to want to get away from you even more. So what we try to do in a verbal behavior approach is instead of saying, this is going to be your teaching setting, you're going to learn here at this table right now and then I'm going to force you to stay here until you understand that. What we do is we say, okay, this is going to be your teaching world. Wherever I am and you are together, that's where the teaching is going to take place. But I'm going to make sure that the teaching is always based upon your motivations in that moment. What is it you want to be doing? Do you want to be playing on the trampoline? Well, we'll go play on the trampoline. If you're playing on the trampoline in a way that I think is acceptable, meaning you're participating in whatever simple instructions I'm giving, or we're playing in a way that, that I'm able to at least, you know, you're not breaking any major rules, well, then we'll keep reinforcing with the trampoline and keep doing it. And then at some point, if the child says, okay, I don't want the trampoline anymore, I want this, or if we say, okay, enough of the trampoline, it's time to go to the swings, and the child goes, oh, swings. Well, then we can go over the swings and we can teach there. We want to teach the child everywhere that they are. We want our teacher to be focused on the child's motivations. We want the, ch the child to see us as not the policeman who comes and only gives you tickets, but we want the child to see us as the policeman 
who comes and saves you when the burglar comes or who helps you get your cat out of the tree. Because we can be either one of those policemen. We can be the policeman who shows up and only yells and screams and tells you what you can and can't do. And what does that child usually want to do? Whoop, I'm gone. And then, uh. Or we can be the policeman that comes to the house and starts saying, hey, do you want to go on the car? Do you want to hit the siren? Do you want to go for a ride? Um, you know, hey, let, let's, and now that policeman is the one that you go, hey, I want to get to know this person. I want to be friends with this person. I want to engage with them. And it's only when you've got this going on a regular basis that you can really teach. Um, so. When we earn instructional control, we don't do it at the table, and we, don't, and we don't do it by forcing the child to participate. We do it by setting up the environment so that the child learns very quickly. The more appropriately I interact with you, the more you're going to give me. The more I interact with dad, the more fun dad's going to be. The more I try to force my will and get my way, the more dad's going to turn and walk away with all those fun things. Which life is better? The life where uh, I sometimes have to interact with dad in ways that I may not want in the moment, but I'm always getting all the fun stuff I want to be doing? Or the one where I fight and kick and scratch to get what I want, but then what I want is I get nothing. I don't get any toys, I don't get any games, and mom and dad walk away with all the stuff, and I go, how long do I want to be over here like this? Yes, I'm the king of this castle, but this is a pretty boring castle. <laughs> Maybe I'd rather be the prince in this castle over here where, yeah, dad is the king and mom's the queen, and they, they tell me what to do sometimes. But being a part of this castle is so much more reinforcing and more rewarding because now I've got access to them, and they can tickle me, and we can play, and, and all the toys that I want, and my favorite foods, and everything else is all available. And what we do is we teach the child from moment to moment which behaviors get you this and which behaviors get you this. So I come up to a child, um, and he wants to jump on the trampoline, and I block access to the trampoline for just a second. I say, touch your nose. And then I prompt the child, I help him. Good job, let's jump. And then I jump with them, making the jumping even more fun because I'm a part of it. Suddenly, the child goes, oh, this wasn't so horrible. And what did I do over there? I just started with your antecedent. I said, touch your nose. That's a brand new <laughs> SD, something they haven't heard before. I prompted it. And then as soon as they did it, what did they get? Positive consequences. They got a reinforcer. They got the jump. And I made the jumping even more fun because I'm there. We call that pairing. I become part of the, the interaction so that the child sees me as the giver of the fun and says, you know what? Jumping on a trampoline is fun, but when I jump with dad, boy, do I get up there high. You know, I can't jump that high on my own, but when dad's doing this, that's even more fun. Or when I'm on the swings with mom and she's standing there, she, woo, she ducks out of the way at the last second. Or she throws the ball and I get to kick it. These are things that make me want to be with mom and the swings together, not just on the swings alone. All of our teaching is always geared towards that. How do we make the things the child wants to do more fun because we're a part of it? Now, you may be thinking to yourself in a classroom, ooh, how do I do this in a classroom? Well, you can do this in a classroom. You have to be more creative. But to some degree, you can do this. And depending upon the child and their level of understanding, sometimes we do it immediately and sometimes we delay it until later through the use of something like maybe token systems, where, yes, as you're interacting with me, I'm interacting with you, I'm making it as fun as I can, but I'm also giving you these little tokens, that when you add up those tokens, they equal a chance to go to McDonald's after school, or a chance to go home and play a video game, or a chance to have recess in a certain area that I don't always get. So the child starts to say, ooh, I really like this, because the more I'm with you, the more I'm getting these positive things. And what happens is, is we teach the child we teach the child that being with us is always better, more reinforcing, more fun, uh, more stimulating, more interesting than being alone. Anytime I'm alone, the only thing I have for myself is to self-stim, or maybe I can walk around, or maybe I can try to get your attention by, oh, but mommy, come on, look what I'm doing. I'm not supposed to eat this. It's not mine. So the child may try all of those things to get your attention, but what we do is we, should, we learn what is the reinforcer. If attention is a major reinforcer, we know when to give the attention and when to shut it down. So the child says, ooh, these kind of behaviors are not getting me what I want. Walking over to mommy and saying, can we play? Or do you want a trampoline? Trampoline? Make, make a sign for something for trampoline? Those things are getting reinforced. Those are things we say, oh, that was great. Yeah, let's make the student's trampoline. And now we're playing with them. And life completely switches when you start doing this comprehensively throughout the child's day.